Welcome to No Direction Beyond, your Starfinder news, reviews, and interviews podcast. I'm Alexander Agunas, No Direction's Everyman Gamer, and I'm joined, as always, by two of the most intrepid Starfinders on the side of the galaxy. Hi, I'm James. I wrote Code Switch. Hi, I'm John. I do Intrepid Heroes and a bunch of other stuff. This week in Starfinder is very exciting because those of you who don't know, PaizoCon actually starts this week. Uh, unfortunately, we don't know anything, so we are going to be just as confused as all of you. And so instead of being on top of the news, we're going to be behind the news because our next show is like mostly through June. Uh, however, that doesn't mean that we don't have a show tonight because we have some really interesting stuff to go over with the new evolutionist class. In our last episode, we did a breakdown on the entire book and we were like, all right, we can't go into too much detail about this class because we're going to do a whole episode on it later. And that episode is now. Here we are. We are with the evolutionist. It's time to shine, Mr. Class. So we're going to give it a deep dive, uh, the No Direction uh, Beyond special. And uh, if for all of you who are listening to us live, uh, we would love to hear your thoughts and questions too. And maybe we'll shout out a few as we're going. Uh, at the end of the show, we'll take some time and we'll talk about PaizoCon predictions for Starfinder and like interesting stuff that's happen happening. Uh, but uh, let's start off with the class. So, uh, John, what can you tell me about the evolutionist at a glance? Well, like if someone said, I want to play an evolutionist and intrepid heroes, John, what would you like summarize it to? I think it's a great full bab class that has some good utility. Um, I'm a little bummed that they uh, eroded the skill uh, back down to four plus intelligence from the eight original. But yeah. you can really um, come up with, I think, a really cool uh role-playing type of character out of it depending on which of the the niches that you decide you want to choose so that's yeah, kind of definitely. my yeah. james you end up playing a lot of classes have you had a chance to like mess around with an evolutionist or have you been too uh waist deep in bees uh, i've been very waist deep in bees um the thing that i did notice is there's a lot of things on reaction so if you like playing a class that doesn't have to take your turn and can just start doing things in other people's turn uh the evolutionist i think lets you do that more than any other current uh, class in Starfinder. Yeah, and I have a little bit of experience with this class. I built an evolutionist for uh, Teenage Wasteland, my Starfinder home game, where uh, the players have a evolutionist as one of their character choices for like a friendly NPC they can bring into stuff. Because, uh, you know, I just like suffering and having to memorize like <laughs> 10 different player character <laughs> options for them. But regardless, it's a lot of fun to talk about, and I'm excited to go over the evolutionist and kind of do a little bit of a dive on it. Um, one of the things I thought that was interesting with this one is like the last couple combatant classes that Izo has put out have had like weird key ability scores where like you have constitution on both right. the nanosite and the vanguard. And like, this is the first one that feels very back to basics with its key ability. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I agree. Having, being able to choose strength or dex, just like you would for a soldier kind of makes sense. Um, yeah. it, you know, that kind of with the, the built-in weapon there that you get, I, I think makes it uh, kind of neat. One of the things I didn't see in here is, uh, and maybe I missed it, was that the weapon didn't have uh, the operative um, uh, trait to it, though. Yeah. Yeah, so like, I, it's really not a great idea to be an evolutionist that specializes in melee weapons unless you're going to go the strength route. You right. definitely, like, if you're going dex, you, you take the Mega Man Blaster in your arm for sure. Right, 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 for sure. Hopefully, maybe that'll be something we get in a, in one of the adaptations. Yeah, the adaptations down the line. I had to check to make sure that was the right name for this. <laughs> um, so many of the like terms just kind of blend together. Yeah, this this class was like, let me take every biology term I can find and put it onto one class. And like sometimes they just get kind of mixed up and all, all over the place. Um, one thing I thought that was cool about this class is that it has a. I wouldn't say it's a strong skill selection, but it has a solidly okay one. Like it's it's yeah. it's a good list. You got acrobatics, athletics, culture, disguise, intimidate, perception, profession, stealth, survival. And you have a class feature that gives you an extra one based on what your niche is. Right. And you have another one that I think just lets you pick one one. And like so you got you got like a good spread here. The evolutionist is definitely a class that can build themselves to help your party handle wherever their skill gaps are, you know, if if you're that type of a team player. Otherwise, you could just keep taking like perception and stealth and like all the really good ones and just ignore all the other ones. <laughs> well, I like the fact I mean, that there's something to be said oh, for being able to do everything. It's mm -hmm. true. I like the fact that the skill set 
kind of maps onto the idea of the evolutionist, right? So yeah. you can evolve to disguise yourself. You can, you know, evolve to survive. You can evolve to be able to fit into different cultures. So even though they seem kind of disparate, right, really different from each other and what you would think in a combatant, because of the nature of the evolutionist, it kind of makes sense from a role play standpoint, which I really appreciate that part. I do. And actually, I think this is a class where the mechanics play really well into the role play, especially when we start getting into what the niches are. Mm -hmm. um, but before, I, I don't know, should we talk about niches first or should we talk about like of, of the evolution track ability? I feel like like between those and the adaptive strike, like those three are kind of the core elements mm -hmm. of this class. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that and the evolutionary focus, but yeah, pro pro I mean, the actual core and the mechanics are a, more evolution track than the adaptive strike. Adaptive yeah, strike definitely. is kind of similar to the Solarian weapon. Yeah, it's uh, honestly, I think it's a little more like on Tropic Strike without the ability to boost it. The damage is, yeah. but then again, I guess the damage is pretty comparable to a Solarian without their weapon crystal, huh? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So, um, so the first thing that you get in this class is a called adaptive strike. Basically, you evolve your body to have a additional weapon that's not a natural weapon. Like natural weapon isn't really a thing that exists in Starfinder aside from a specific uh like universal creature rule. It's just like a weapon that's part of your body and you basically get to choose everything about it. You choose what kind of damage it does, you choose whether it's melee or range. You basically only really have that one choice and its damage does get better as you go up but uh, one thing i would have liked uh and i am wondering what ended up happening because i remember we had john compton on the show and he told us you were going to be able to get more of them uh, it mm. seems like that was cut from the class which is a little disappointing it's something i'd like to see come back as like either like one of an evolution focused or as like an adaptation or something but uh, i think it's still cool i think it's awesome that you can kind of customize your weapon and do whatever you want with it what do you think james mm. Yeah, I mean, it, it does cover pretty much everything you'd want to do, except your specialized weapon types. Yeah. Um, and there are things, um, ad adaptations, I was about to say ad adaptions, adaptations that give you the qualities of other different weapons, not yeah. always. Um, so you don't, like, fully miss out on that. Um, but I do understand wanting to do everything as your ev base evolutionist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, like, I'm willing to pay for it. I'll take a couple adaptations for it. It's just, like, give me the, the choice. But um, <laughs> so like the big mechanic that this thing has uh, every Starfinder class after the core rulebook has like some sort of big flashy class mechanic of like resources to juggle and uh, whether or not you like that is a matter of preference. But for the evolutionist, it's called the evolution track, which works in a manner that's very similar to how vanguards generate their or I think it says yeah, the game, they, they generate mutation points. Vanguards generate entropy points. They used to call it evolution points in the playtest. They changed that name because two EPs was too difficult. But yes. um, yeah, <laughs> so many EPs, <laughs> but uh, they're <laughs> mutation points now. And basically how it works is that every round, your body is just evolving when you're in stressful situations. You can spend resolve points to evolve faster, but mm -hmm. unlike the Vanguard, where like the Vanguard's whole shtick is kind of doing things to generate points, the evolutionist is just much more like on a track. Like it's called right. evolution track. Like they, mm -hmm. they go and they move up. Uh, as they get points, they get abilities that give them benefits. Most of them are passive, cool, fun things. And you also have a cap on how many points you can have based on your, I believe it's your constitution. Uh, and um, level, too. Your level? Oh, yeah, it's your, your level. level. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, like, you can't have a, beyond a certain number. And then there are also some abilities that let you spend evolution points to do things. Like, one of them is you could spend one of their, your mutation. And I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm going to use evolution points and mutation points interchangeably because my brain doesn't work well. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, you could basically spend mutation points in order to generate a to generate your adaptive stripe faster basically like you were quick drawing it which is pretty cool i'm like all right that's fine like I, one of the things i like about this class feature is like it gives you benefits for storing them and it gives you right. benefits for spending them but mm -hmm. you never feel like you have to do one over the other mm -hmm. like none mm -hmm. of the benefits you get are so colossal that it's like it, it doesn't have the solarian problem where uh in the core rulebook solarian you look at the proton uh track and you look at the graviton track and you're like wow bonus damage 
Reflex saves on my worst saving throw. <laughs> Bonus damage. <laughs> Reflex saves on my worst saving throw. Like, like that's it's not that it doesn't have that same issue here because you can sort of just do what you want and like the bonuses aren't like earth shattering. Like I think one of them is I get a five foot bonus to my speed. Golly gee, it's an enhancement bonus, so it doesn't stack with speed suspensions. Like okay, <laughs> <laughs> cool, awesome. Yeah. It is something also to be balanced against in the niches. Uh, each niche gets drawbacks based on how many mutation points you have. Uh, mm -hmm. So there are mechanics for shedding them if you don't want higher negatives. Um, and we'll get into those a little bit later. So it is a bit of a balancing act of, do I want this? Am I going to remember this? Am I going to pick something that makes me remember more? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think for me, the ones that are probably the best, uh, getting to two points and giving your adaptive strike a critical hit effect is pretty awesome. Uh, mm -hmm. there's like a flat bonus to armor class at four points. And then at number five, you can basically just be like, Hey, guess what? I'm adding half my evolutionist level to damage. And it's like, Oh, are you now? Okay. Yeah. Uh, you're, you're getting another weapon specialization yeah. damage bonus basically. Like, oh, okay. It's, it's basically that, you remember that ring from the second book of dead sons that was so OP that they banned it from Starfinder Society. Oh, the ring of, I love you ring of fangs. <laughs> yeah. I remember oh, you yeah. when you were powerful. It's ring of oh, fangs, man. but on one attack per yeah. round, but it's yeah, like, yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Um, now granted, like one of the things that I think that's important to mention is that, uh, you can also like just spend EP for no reason other than to just spend them. And that might be because you don't want to reach certain thresholds in the class. Like, I think if, correct me if I'm wrong, I think most of the niches have like, when you spend this number of points, you go into the evolution and the bad things start happening. It reminds me of like Oracle and Pathfinder second edition, where as you start spending focus points, you just get cursed. And like this class curses you too. Similar. Uh, it really depends on the track. For like Eldritch, the first yeah. drawback is when you have one MP. Yeah. <laughs> so Definitely. if you are using any mutation points, uh, you're taking that uh, niche as negative. Yes. Um, so, but moving on from that, we mentioned flexible skill where you get a bonus skill, right. a class skill at first level. And then as you level up, you you go from that errata six skill points up to eight rather than eight to 10. I, I, I would have loved more, but. You know, it's good. It's fun. I like the I like the flexibility. It reminds me of how Solarian just gets a free class skill too, and I think that's a good design. Um, then you get your niche, and John talked about this when we had him on the show. But the niche isn't like a soldier fighting style where it's like five abilities. It's really just three that are tied to the one. I mm -hmm. agree with his logic. I think that that makes these niches way more presentable and like less of a a panic option. It's like, oh, okay, I only have to worry about these three abilities. That's fine. Yeah, it reminds yeah. me a lot of um, the operative specializations. You know, you get the main one, at, you know, it, kind of the same level breakpoints, you know, where you get something special you can do. And then it's really the adaptations later that make the, the big changes for you. Yeah. And the niches. Mm, niches. Niche. Yeah, niche. It's like quiche, but your body is the egg. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a, I, yeah. I don't like that all of all of you <laughs> listeners you can't see it but james is like visibly gagging on the camera it's great uh, i i've yeah, done my job a, here um, that's yucky yeah the next ability are niches uh going down the class list yeah, um was... a lot of them have negative um, or resisting throws and they're the standard 10 half the evolutionist level plus your key ability score so in general 50 percent of the time they're not going to work as intended that's fine that's just our final math <laughs> Um, that's the Starfinder. That's why you need all those skill points. And Starfinder, your DCs and your your DCs for skills and for like combat abilities is almost is not quite too e rigid, but pretty similar. Yeah. Um, so as long as you're keeping track with it, you're probably at a fifty to sixty percent. Sixty is very high. Usually fifty to fifty five percent success rate. Yeah, um, definitely. But at first level, your your niche gives you like an ability along with a class skill and also your first drawback. And as you level up, you get uh, more milestones, which allow you to do things more often and more drawbacks. Hooray. Yeah. The, the, the higher level you get, the more like the more points you spend into your like evolution, the more like stuff happens to you. It's like, oh, okay, this is this is scary. Um, 
I, I I'm I'm very curious to see what the feedback is going to be on that because I know my experience with the Oracle in Second Edition is like everybody just kind of accepts the the drawback as the thing that happens, and then as soon as combat's over, it's like, but I start praying to make it go away. I'm like, oh okay, maybe people don't like that. We'll have to see. Like I. I personally, like when I'm GMing, I'm like, I don't have the brain power to remember all these penalties when I'm GMing. So I'm just going to like keep their points low and spend all of them and never have to worry about the penalty beyond the first one. Um, <laughs> then, uh, but you know what? Like in addition to the niche, there's a lot of really interesting customization that goes into this class. Um, one of them that I really want, I'm excited to talk about is called Augmented Form, which is essentially your, ev it is it is cheaper to install evolutions into, or not evolutions, to install augmentations into your body. And so every niche is associated with one specific type of augmentation. And the rules specifically say that species graphs from Alien Archive 4, I believe, species graphs count as all types. Like that's their, their rules. Like the, oh. the rules for them say that yeah. you could choose whether it's the result of cybernetics or magic or like biotech. And so in this case, because there's that rule, it just says these count as all of them, but they have to be like the same general type. So like if you are the eldritch niche, then all of your augmentations from the species graphs are like magical augmentations that change your body to be more like that species. But it means that every one, basically, everyone, every niche has basically two pools they can draw from, which is pretty cool. And you can have additional um, augmentations in systems as long yeah. as ones, ones associated with your niche, which I think is it makes it uh, even even cooler. So you could have two, you know, uh, throat augmentations or whatever, or, yeah, you know, things like that. So and you have one augmentation of your chosen type for free, like like mm -hmm. like you just get it. So that you don't have to, uh, honestly. So one of the things I was going to say is this ability is clearly trying to make augmentations into the things that characters spend their credits on, where like soldiers and other characters would buy guns, right? Right. This is like because I mean that's essentially the role that the Solarian weapon crystal serves. It it is to be a thing that Solarians who take the weapon spend their money on, and I feel like this ability is like, hey, yeah, you're do the same thing, but for augmentations. I think it's very interesting that it has this focus on augmentations because there you can make the argument that like weapons generally drop when you fight stuff in Starfinder Adventure Pass, but augmentations do drop, but they're rarer. Mm -hmm. And Paizo APs definitely have a decision where the credits don't necessarily flow in as bountiful as one might like. And so that kind of does mean that, I, in my opinion, this ability is kind of like, oh, yeah, well, you're not going to have as you're not going to get free weapons from the adventure. So, like, here, I have a small discount. I don't I don't know. I in my in, in playing it, I think that it's kind of like it's nice, but it, it kind of needs to be supported by adventure design. So if you're a GM playing with someone that has an evolutionist at the table, remember that, like. They do want evolutions and or augmentations, and uh, mm -hmm. I guess you're gonna have to figure out how you get an augmentation out of a corpse and what that means. Ugh. It's easy. It's just you go you you when you find the person asleep, you safely remove their hip implant and you put it into yourself. Yeah, but like so, one of the species graphs is cheek pouches. So if I kill mm -hmm. a Yasoki, do I have to hope they have a cheek pouch augmentation, or can I just take that Yasoki's cheek pouches and make it into a horrific biotech? augmentation you would need the augmentation because otherwise you're just wearing a dead person's face oh no <laughs> yes. a, a necrograph that's called a necrograph, uh, necrograph what if i take yes. the sepulcher yeah, but no 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 but there's no necromantic energy in that that's just yes. being a monster yes. <laughs> <laughs> there are just serial like killers that have done that i don't think we need to go that direction <laughs> that's true um, I, I think players are going to buy all these things anyway, like playing soldiers, like you're going to yeah. buy all three of those things. So because you don't have to buy a weapon and you're getting augments at a discount, uh, you get to be the tank of the party because you can afford armor. Yeah, you can afford armor. Buy it. Uh, also, you might even <laughs> want to, like, especially if you take the uh, the strength option, you might want to take heavy armor proficiency because this class doesn't give it to you. you got to right. take it. No. Uh, but if you do yeah. and you save up enough of those points, you can get the armor bonus to your AC and you could be just as tanky as a Vanguard. Yeah, do it. Yeah, I think you could also use a shield too. Yeah, I think, I think you get basic. Get I think you get yeah, 
you don't that's no, weird it doesn't say oh, well. yeah take another feat for a shield <laughs> yeah i mean you're, you're gonna have so many anyway yeah but you do um, get grenades at least so yeah chuck them <laughs> good stuff i hate grenade proficiency why do we have that it's, it's an ac5 to hit the intersection yeah, i know it doesn't matter if you're not proficient i hate it why is it there <laughs> <laughs> just eat the grenade um, so starting at second level is when you get adaptations and this is the classes version of like Solarian revelations or Vanguard yeah. disciplines. Like this is the, the bread and butter class feat option for your class. Uh, we'll talk some more about those specifically, but, uh, they come later in the book at the end of the class. So we'll just go right to talking about the fulcrum, which is interesting. I like the fulcrum. I really do. And the reason I like it is because it's essentially a rules mechanic that lets you put weapon fuges on your adaptive yeah. strike. You have like a trinket or like a personal item that you really like. And you're like, I'm just going to slap this weapon, this weapon thing to make my mm -hmm. fist punch harder or whatever. That's cool. I, I'm, I'm, I dig that. Very awesome. Yeah, it's an amulet of mighty fist. It is. It's, <laughs> it's an amulet of mighty fist. That's your class feature, essentially. Um, mm -hmm. I, I feel like you can make the argument that maybe this should have been a magic item in the book for characters that want to use unarmed strikes, but I also, I think it's pretty cool as a unique class feature too. I don't know. I don't, th I think that's going to be a matter of preference. Uh, at third level, you get a skill boost. Uh, it is essentially the insight bonus that we're very used to classes getting as they level up. It's the same progression three and every four levels after plus one insight bonus. It applies specifically to your Nishi's associated school. And you can also pick an additional skill to apply it to. So you get a little bit of flexibility in how your skills are. And this is nice. I, I'm definitely a fan of this because you can feel not having the scaling bonus on the soldier and the Vanguard, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. especially the Vanguard. Um, yeah. obviously you get weapon specialization. We don't need to talk about that. Uh, but at level five, you get evolution drain. And I know this is something that John is very excited to talk about because he loves draining things from people. I do. <laughs> I don't no, know I, I made I, that up. I, yeah, no, I, you know, I want to, I actually, I want to talk about weapon specialization. You just kind of blew right by it. Yeah, um, there is specialization. I think there's a, a interesting part in there because of the flexibility in what you get to choose as a weapon depending on if you pick a ranged or melee weapon, mm -hmm. the type of specialization you get is different so as not to make you OP with your specialization, basically. Because your ranged attacks end up being like small arm attacks, so you get a small arm specialization, and your melee attacks are basic weapon, uh, basic melee weapon, so you get a, a standard uh, melee type of thing. So yeah. I think that's in, it's important. They didn't just say, oh, you just get one type for all kind of thing, so... Yeah. I thought that was kind of nice that they did that. Um, yeah. I mean, it, it is similar, but uh, it's based on EAC and KAC. Yeah. yeah. So it's yeah. actually so based KAC, on energy type. Yeah. So like if you play yeah. an adaptive strike that is a melee weapon that hits EAC because it's like it does fire, it only gets half of your bonus. Mm -hmm. So uh, it I, honestly, if you're going to be a melee uh, uh, evolutionist, you're probably going to want to like hit people with your heavy physical weapons instead. Yeah, because KAC gives you one and one half of your evolutionist level to damage. Yeah. One and one half. That is more than the normal. Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. But I mean, like, <laughs> but like also, like, it, it gives your full level to just regular deck shots, so like, it's still good. Like, I, I don't know. I, th yeah. I think it's interesting because you, you will beat people up, and then we also talked about there's already an ability that lets you add half your level to right. your attacks once per round so like theoretically yes. you could be adding double your evolution attack level to your damage it's like this class is sleeping on some serious damage is what i'm saying exactly no i i think so i think so uh, uh your evolution uh drain basically is uh, another way that you can get your uh your mutant points so when yes. you're hitting somebody and so it's you know when, with the vanguard you got your entropy points by taking damage and doing special things I think this is a lot more straightforward and it kind of fits a lot better, I think, into uh, what a mutant type ability would be. You know, you know, if you're undead type or whatever, being able to suck some of whatever that is out of the thing you're hitting to add it to yourself. <laughs> right. I think that's mm -hmm. that it really kind of fits the, the 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 role play of the character. It's very cool. Um, yeah, reminds me of like DNA getting sucked by uh, yeah. like viruses and stuff. 
yeah or like uh the the aliens from alien and their little tiny mouths just like ripping part of you out and getting better it's awesome i love it uh <laughs> but honestly one of my favorite things in this whole class is the next feature which is evolutionary focus uh basically it's another s- subclass mechanic where you could pick another subclass and mix and match it with your niche it's very mm-hmm. cool you either specialize in augmentations in fighting or in buffing allies which is very interesting. Uh, personally, of these three, before talking with them, my favorite is Augmentation. Do you two have favorites? I like the Packmaster, but I think it's a weird name. So Yeah, I group that. <laughs> mm. uh, combat. I'm a, I'm a sucker for minus three to uh, attacks. Well, that Full is attacks. unexpected. We did not plan this. So how about everybody <laughs> will just talk about their favorite one? So the reason that I like the Augmentation ability is the first thing you get is you get another free augmentation of the type that is associated with your niche. So it's like, all right, now I've got two augmentations in my body that I didn't have to pay for. Radical. And then um, that new one is at your level minus two, but like you get this ability at level seven. So you're about two levels, three levels away from just being like, hey, I'm Eldritch niche. I get free four souls. And then it's like, oh, okay, cool. Um, each time you gave a level, you can swap that uh, that augmentation with that restriction of a of level minus two. And, but you can just be like, oh, yeah, my body evolved since last level. I don't have four souls now. Now I breathe fire. It's good. Um, and then also it improves the discount you get from the augmented form from 10% to 20%. So like at that point, at 20%, you're starting to like see, like especially at this level, level seven, when augmentations are costing thousands of credits. It's like, oh, I'm taking off a couple hundred that's like a grenade or two nice and then your 13th level advanced ability that but that discount goes from 20 to 30 percent and you get an uh you get an extra augmentation that can overlap so you have two augmentations that can overlap in your systems instead of just one and then um and the, the one at least one of them has to be like your niches type but that's hardly a penalty like that's just like that's just good manners at that point <laughs> um uh and then your ultimate at 19th level the discount is 40 percent, so like almost half and like at that point you're talking about the best augmentations costing like hundreds of thousands of credits so like that's the difference between getting one augmentation and getting like two whole augmentations yeah, yeah. um you also get uh you also get another overlapping augmentation so your body is just like filled you have so many and that can either be it's one of it's one of those things that it, it's like it's either not all that meaningful or it's amazing because if you are really familiar with your augmentation types and you take a lot of care in like what your niche is and what you're overlapping and why you can get some crazy things like one thing that's off the top of my head is if you go to sepulcher you can combine the skittermander hypergraph which is a heart graph with the black heart which basically makes it so you never need to breathe because your heart is just this rotted little undead heart so you basically have two hearts in your body and one of them makes you really hyper and the other one is basically dead (laughs) and they're both really good um i think the the system that is probably the strongest for overlap is skin because like skin is a lot of like the uh the resistances and the damage reductions. So like getting a discount on skin grafts and getting to have re- damage reduction and an energy resistance for basically like two for one is very strong. This is why augmentation is my favorite. Because if you were willing to engage with the equipment system, you could do shenanigans. Plenty of them. Mm. But you gotta spend money. I mean, yeah, you have to spend money, but the best <laughs> class features need money. Every soldier class feature needs you to buy a weapon, unless you want to punch them for 1d3. Although Shoku had improved unarmed strike, so I don't know. Maybe that's wrong. So, James, you're up. Combat. Let's go. Oh, it's me. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, combat. Uh, you, ba- you get a... Ba- you get a I, sorry, I thought... Uh, yeah, It's a better version of uh, the soldier's onslaught, at least at first. Uh, you take it, and you do more attacks, and you get... a uh, lower penalty mm-hmm. uh and i like it i like doing more hits because that gives you more chance for crits i'm a gremlin you see and i like doing gremlin things um i also like the rend at uh 19th level where you hit with two of yep. your attacks and you get a, a fun little burst of damage it is weird if there's a fortitude save for half 
like at 19th level, like you should just be able to do it. But mm. it's it's fun, extra damage. It's gonna be something you're doing anyway. Yeah. Um, I'm the juggernaut. I'm the juggernaut. You really are. Order. I feel. I think that like, I, I I to me, combat is the simple one. Like it's what you would expect the evolutionist to be able to right. do, right? Like every other combat in class has onslaught. So like the fact that onslaught is here makes sense. And in a way, the uh, the the evolutionary focus is almost like an alternate class feature mechanic baked into the class already for you. Like, because to me, it's almost like saying these are right. what a, 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 a melee combatant class would normally get. Here are two things you could swap them out for for ultimate alternate options. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, also, there's just a, a small part of me that because the adaptive strike does not say you can't put attachments onto your weapon, makes me think you can put attachments onto your weapon. And I, don't I want think you you're to wrong. have. I want you to have a gun arm that you could just put like a bayonet on because that's real I, stupid. I, wow. and I, I love want, that. If if Colony dies in Attack of the Swarm, I want you to make an evolutionist whose entire thing is getting a tripod out and putting their arm on it. <laughs> so I did look no, at it's that. Built it is, in. It's, it's like extra fingers that go yeah. down. You know? <laughs> Bipods are only for long arm and sniper weapons. So unless you, there's one to make it a long arm, uh, it won't work. But if it does, then it makes your soldiers onslaught better because bipods reduce your full attack penalty by one. Well, yeah. <laughs> Dustin Knight is in chat. Dustin, you know what you need to do. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> give, give people finger gun, an actual finger gun with an actual finger tripod. <laughs> finger like, finger sniper. That one. <laughs> that's so good. Um, that's so good. All right. The last one we have to talk about for evolutionary focus is all you, John. Tell us about the pack master. Yeah, so the, the pack master gets its name because you are protecting your pack. And I, I guess this is a connotation to a beast type, like so you're like rats and protecting the other parts of your pack. But yeah. the interesting thing about this is you can share your adaptation. At the initial level, it has to be an adjacent, uh, one adjacent willing ally, and it works for about half your duration. As you get to higher level, you can share it with two people within 15 feet. And then the ultimate at uh, 19th level, you can share with as many people as you want uh, within 20 feet. So I guess if you can have an entire army within 20 feet of you, <laughs> right, yep. you can give them all your adaptation. That makes it really powerful at that point. Yeah, You're totally. really the yeah. leader of the pack then. So Yeah, but, absolutely. But what I like about this, so I really enjoyed playing uh, Vanguard, right, high-level Vanguard. And the neat thing about the Vanguard is it really does a lot to buff and aid its allies. It doesn't get the onslaught, you know, it doesn't get the three attacks and to do mega damage it, you know, like that. But it does get some nice protective buffs. And with all these adaptations that you have, the, the variety, the fact that you can share them with your allies, I think makes it a nice buff in addition to you still being a strong combatant. Mm. Yeah. yeah. With the Vanguard sharing, your defensive abilities is the only reason that that's a tank. Uh, cause you run into the standard problem of, man, this person is hard to hit and isn't going to kill me. I can just ignore them. Yeah. So when you're tanking, you either need to be able to spread your defense among other people willingly, or you need to be able to do enough damage. So thankfully that seems to at least. So the next thing on our list to talk about is going to be accelerated evolution. Uh, would you like to take over on this one, James? Uh, when you gain MP, you gain two MP mutation points. <laughs> you did uh, it! Hooray! I Woo! know, and when you spend a resolve point to gain a mutation, you can gain two instead. I do like that they say it as an option. <laughs> I So, like, on one hand, I think this is a good feature, like, and it needs to exist, especially if you want to rack up those points. Part of me wants to know why this is a separate feature and isn't part of like evolution track. It feels weird that it's just like, because and, th and this has nothing to do with like design. It's like layout. Like why? I don't understand. Oh, right. Uh, right. You know I what guess I mean? it fills the page. Cause I, the thing about it is, is it's not an action to do. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's just a passive thing. Like, okay, cool. Yeah. It, it gives you something to use resolve points. Cause I don't think there's a lot of things resolve points generally are used for. 
Well, you um you get this class baseline spends resolve points to generate MP. Like that's part of evolution track. Yeah, so like this yeah. increases the number of points you generate when you do it. It's good. I just like I'm like oh, you, you you could have put that in the other thing. But I, I, don't I, know. I guess right. you could have just made that part of the scaling of it. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, the format yeah. is more weird than the actual mechanic. Yeah, exactly. And I to me, it seems like it's almost a case where like if you look on the, the table, this is the only thing you get at 10th level. So like maybe they were just like, oh, let's make it very clear that this is the thing you get at this level. Like, and so we don't have a blank row. I don't know about anybody else. If, if <laughs> I look at a class table and there's a blank row on that chart, I am filled with rage. <laughs> so much rage. Doesn't matter what class I'm playing. Doesn't matter if I'm getting spells. If there's a blank on that table, I feel like I got nothing. And even if that's not true, it just looks like it's true because I look at, wow, what super special thing do I? Oh, just like that. <laughs> just like that. I played too many yeah. gunslingers. I know it's all disappointment. Those words don't mean anything. <laughs> that's, ow, that's accurate. Yeah, no, at least when no. you're a cleric, at least when you're a cleric, you get spells. I, it's true. I mean, the gunslinger got nothing after what level three? Level three was or five? Le five. Level five is when it caps out. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, you get nimble every four levels past second. Great, a plus one dodge bonus. Great That's a class feature. Amazing. Yeah, so hooray! Uh, now, speaking of class features that do stuff, though, uh, at fourteenth level, you gain evolution drinker, which is an improvement on evolution drain. Evolution Drinker is basically like it increases the number of points you generate, uh, your mutation points that you generate for draining. And uh, if you generate more four points in this way, like the maximum number, uh, the target becomes nauseated for one yes. round and, and then sickened for three rounds instead of just being sickened for one round. That's nasty. Like that's like there's no save against that. Like they already failed their fort and you generated points. Like at that point, you you supercharged your evolution track. And they can't, they they lose half of their actions next turn. Like, whoa, nasty. I love it. It's very cool. Um, <laughs> you also have a thing like when you critically hit someone, you can generate more points that way too. It's right. it's a good ability. It's a nice improvement on the baseline, and I like it. And we you're not going to hear us talking about a capstone here because unlike most of the other classes, where like all the the Starfinder classes share a capstone regardless of their subclass. The evolution is this collapse capstone is determined by their niche. Mm -hmm. So we'll talk a little bit about capstones as we go into the niches, um, which is now. There are four niches in total, and they go with the four different types of augmentations. Uh, there's the Eldritch niche for, for Magitech. There's the mechanic uh, me mechanized niche for Cybertech. There is the Sepulchral, which goes out for Sepulchre, which is wonderful, which for undead necrographs. And then Vital is for Biotech. And uh, yeah, uh, remember, there isn't one for species graphs because those are considered all types. So like they're shared between all of them. Um, I know for me, my favorite one of these is Eldritch. Do you two have favorites? Hmm, not Eldritch. Oh, <laughs> that, that wasn't oh that wasn't one of my favorites. So um, I like Eldritch. Uh, I kind of like Vital. I didn't like the I didn't like the name. I don't understand why it's called Vital. I, I think it's supposed to going after life and yeah. so vital is like life but yeah. i agree it's I, i'm not crazy about the name either did you have a favorite james i uh, i know my flesh is weak what what is that cop well, from the moment i understood the weakness Cyber of my flesh uh, it disgusted me Second, <laughs> yes. mechanized you're into mechanized gotcha yes, of course. so i'm gonna talk about eldritch and then you two can talk about your favorites and then i guess the one that's left out is the Pacoral because nobody can say it <laughs> yeah <laughs> i didn't I even know how to say Sepulchral? that so. sepulchral sepulchral is probably right Sep sepulchral it, it reminds me of that store in the mall uh yeah so sepulcher sepulcher <laughs> Sep sepulcher sepulcher is the thing right yeah. oh my oh I, this is a french word isn't it i blame the french <laughs> So um, Eldritch is the Magitech specialist. So all of the class features that, that say you get bonus augmentations in your body, you get bonus, uh, you could do, you could get discounts on things. They all apply to Magitech for this class. And your class skill is mysticism. So you get a scaling mysticism bonus. This makes this one of two, like two, arguably three classes in the game that are like good at mysticism that aren't a spellcaster and arguably the spellcaster that's the best is the mystic so right you know it's pretty cool that you get a, a good mystic using melee class in my opinion um 
your instinct gives you spell resistance and bonuses of saving throws as you gain mutation points. And there are not many ways to get spell resistance in Starfinder. There's like a couple Magitek augmentations and like I think one armor upgrade and that's it. So like this is a big deal. Um, it definitely is a really funny way to make spell enemy spellcasters feel even worse about their life choices because now in addition to you getting a bonuses on saving throws uh if they try to hit you with their spells most of them require spell resistance you have a chance to just be like nah not today um your drawback though is that as you embrace your magical nature uh it becomes easier to beat you up <laughs> is the best way to put it so you take the first time you take damage each turn you take more damage if it's from a kinetic source which can hurt when you're a class that is a tanky uh type i re i think that for uh, for eldritch they definitely make the best with having the the ranged weapon and not hanging around too much kind of like a mid-ranged character is probably going to serve you best to reduce the amount of, of opportunities enemies have to like really shoot you and take advantage of how wonderfully your your body captures those bullets when you're shot um <laughs> that being said uh spell bending is their base ability at first level this ability is one that is either incredibly cool if you have a spellcaster in the party or fundamentally useless if you don't. So I don't recommend Eldritch if you're playing an evolutionist in like Starfinder society where you don't know who's going to be at your table. Essentially what spellbending does is your ally can cast a spell on you and you get a saving throw against that spell. And if you fail that saving throw, this is if you fail then you get to choose all parameters for the spell as if you'd cast it from your location. It essentially lets you slingshot the spell. So like, let's say I'm like, I my, my ally has a spell that has a range of 25 yards. The enemy is 40, but I'm between them. My spellcaster friend can cast spell on me. And then even if I, even if I fail my saving throw, I can bounce it for them to the next person. Mm -hmm. Pretty cool. It gets better if you pass your saving throw though. Because if you pass the saving throw, some aspect of the spell gets better. Uh, there are a whole bunch of different choices. Uh, you get to pick one of three. You can either make the, make the spell's saving throw DC go up by two, up to a maximum of 10 plus half your evolutionist level plus your key ability score modifier. That's good. Like this is As James already alluded to, this is a game where spellcasters struggle to have enemies fail spells. So like getting a three plus two that stacks with spell focus is very strong. Um, you also get uh you can also choose to have the spellcaster's spell level be counted as being too higher for caster level purposes. Or if the spell does damage, um, you could replace you can bounce the spell normally, do nothing else, and replace your adaptive strikes damage with one of the damage types dealt by the spell until the end of your next turn. So if like your adaptive strike normally does physical damage and your opponent casts a fireball on you and you bounce the fireball, after the fireball resolves, your adaptive strike can do fire damage instead. It's very cool. It's completely useless if you don't have another spellcaster in the party to play this teamwork game with. <laughs> but it's very cool. Um, at 10th level, you gain Arcane Leap. This is a, essentially Flash Teleport, which is a very common ability that like Witch Warpers and Technomancers get. But mm -hmm. it doesn't cost resolve points. You just do it. Boop, 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 boop. Yeah, very good. And then the last thing you get is uh, you, you, you become either a Dragon, Fae, or Outsider. And uh, you become immune to either acid, cold, electricity, fire, or sonic damage. You pick one, you're immune to it. It's good. That's a, that's that is a a solid capstone, uh, especially in a game where laser rifles are very popular. You shot yeah. me with light. Light. It does nothing. <laughs> so I just, James, why would anybody want to be a dragon? I I don't know. <laughs> I mean, like dragonkin are like a normal thing. You could just do that. Like be an outsider. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine be weird yeah cybernetics uh you you your augmentation type augmentation type is cybernetics yay laser eyes um class skill engineering because you're a robot man uh their instinct is bar none your i think your best tanking one uh choose one type of kinetic damage and one type of energy damage uh those are your vulnerable damages you reduce the damage taken from damage every other type of damage that's not that equal to amount equal to half your current mp mm -hmm. At level 10, that reduction goes to your equal amount of MP. So at like level, what is that, 13 or 14? Might be 15, where you start getting to 7, seven MP per level max. You just yeah. get flat DR7 for mm. everything except two damage types. You're, it turns <laughs> out the flesh was weak. 
Yeah, flesh is weak. <laughs> uh, there is the drawback in that uh, when you do get hit with one of your vulnerable damages, the first time you take additional damage equal to half your evolutionist level plus your MP total. So uh, you are vulnerable to your vulnerable damage, but be vulnerable that's to fine. electricity. Just go yeah, fit the theme or be vulnerable to fire and just never get to use this ability against energy damage, I guess. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, when you get uh, three or more MP, you become robotic, you become a construct or whatever your creature type is, whatever is worse for you. Um, you also can't gain morale bonuses, uh, which I, there's some, I think a lot, Envoy gave a fair amount of them. Yeah. Uh, not sure who else gives. It basically makes of... you immune to your, your Envoy party member. Some of their things that provide morale bonuses um some they also provide a fair amount of insight bonuses and other types um in in the pathfinder brain in me tells me heroism but that's about it yeah. um you also take a penalty equal to half your mp to charisma skills but who cares flesh is weak except intimidate because flesh used to know their place uh, sure. your, <laughs> your abilities are avenging burst uh when a creature is within 10 feet of you and they damage you you can spend one point of uh your mutation points to vent plaza at them uh it does 1d4 uh and uh, 1d4 of electricity and fire damage for every two levels you have, so maximum 10d4. Um, reflex half. You could spend MP as well uh, when that happens to increase those to d6s or to d8s. Uh, so you could just be, you know, if somebody hits you, you just throw down five d8s, reflex half. You brought this on yourself. 10th um, level, you get rapid reboot as a standard action. You're flat footed, you gain double your dr bonus. Uh, and at the beginning of the term, you can end one of your current ongoing adaptations um, to gain back stamina equal to your twice your evolutionist level. So if you're getting peppered by a lot of little things, you can effectively shut down, reboot, and have more power. Uh, the niche metamorphosis is kind of terrible. That's the only downside. It, you become a construct and you gain immunity to fatigue and exhaustion. None of the fun things about being a robot. Um, like if they just made you immune to mind affecting and morale bonuses, that'd be cool. Yeah. Hit the theme. Gaining immunity to fatigue and exhaustion is just like getting filled with adrenaline. Like that's not, doesn't feel special. It doesn't feel cool. All the all your other powers are really cool, so it bounces. Yeah, that's fair. Um, the last one on the list then is you, John. Please serenade yes. us with tales of vital power. So vital power. This is where you start getting monstrous body parts and adaptations and ooziness and lots of tentacles or whatever you want to get. Um, so mm -hmm. some of the stuff is is just okay. You know, I have to take the adaptation type is biotech, which is pretty common. Um, yeah. class skills, life science, which I think is underused by a lot of classes. So it's kind of good to have that in a combatant to be able to do that. Um, so I think that's kind of nice. Uh, the instinct here, once per round, when you have one or more, um, uh, mutant points, uh, the first time you gain hit points or stamina points from an effect, you increase the number by the amount equal to half your MP. So not a lot. I mean... It's really not a lot. Now this increases at uh, seventh level, so it goes one and a half times your total, uh, and then tenth level two times, and then thirteenth level three times. I'm sorry, uh, two times at thirteenth level, and then three times at seventeenth level. By seventeenth level, it's making a little bit of difference, but you have so many hit points and stamina points there. I don't think this is going to be a deal breaker. Um, the uh, first level thing, the biotic invigoration that you has. Uh, some usefulness as a swift action. Uh, you can spend one one point. Uh, I'm sorry uh, to to regain a number of stamina points equal to your your evolutionist level. So another way to get stamina uh, in combat, swift action. So that's not many ways you can do that. So I think that's kind of a kind of a nice add. Uh, at the start of each of your next three turns, you and adjacent ally regain a number of stamina points equal to your evolutionist level. Um, mm -hmm. So that's not bad. Again, sharing. I like to share. Uh, once you use this <laughs> ability, though, you can't use it again until you do the rest thing, right? 10-minute rest. This is uh, time. Yeah. 10th level, uh, your adrenaline rush, you move with exceptional speed. So as a swift action, you can take a guarded step and gain enhancement bonus to your AC and reflex saves until the beginning of your next turn. So it's kind of nice to, to have that freebie there. If you spend two resolve points when activating this, you could move up to half your speed with the guarded step. So God, that's so cool. That's a long guarded step. I mean, that's that's kind of neat, yeah. right? Um, and uh, your enhancement bonus 
uh, increases the plus two. Now, the reason why I like this is that the niche metamorphosis at 20th level. Now, you got to wait to 20th level, but at this point, you become a creature type of aberration, monstrous, humoid, ooze, or plant, whatever. I don't really care about that part, right? You gain immunity to critical hit effects and reduce the damage you take from critical hits by the amount equal to 20 plus your key ability modifier. So Ooh. it gives you some ability to withstand crits. And at that high level, the crits are doing massive amount of damage. So I kind of like that. Now, the big drawback to this is that your will save is already your worst one. Um, <laughs> if you have one MP, you take a penalty, your will save equal to half your MP total. Uh, and so that makes it even worse. If you have three MP, you can't do anything that requires patience or concentration. You can't cast spells. You can't do anything. So, so um, yeah, this is kind of the dumb brute. Dumb, dumb tough brute is uh, the approach here. Yeah, no, this is great. I finally made the connection. Uh, for like three rounds of combats, you're almost invincible. Because uh, Biotic Invigoration would proc your instinct. Yep. So you just feed back, giving yourself more stamina. After and... those three rounds, I don't know what you're doing. Your flesh is weak. <laughs> forever. But for those three rounds, it's going to be very hard to put you down. Yeah, yeah no, it's very good. Uh, honestly, all four of the niches are very cool. Um, I think it's it's strong content. Like, it's, yeah. it's really good. Um, because it plays so heavily off of augmentation types, I'm not really sure if we'll see new ones in the future. Like... The only thing I could potentially see is one based on a species graft, but like that feels superfluous when all of them can pick it. It would just be a downside, you know what I mean? Like, you know what I mean? Like, because you else gets two. Uh, but I mean, I like what we have. It's have. It's interesting. It's cool. Um, let's move on to the class feat section, also called evolutionist adaptations. This follows a very similar pattern to what Solarians have. You have a pool of options at second another pool at six another pool at 10 a pool at 14 and then finally a pool at 18th level uh there are a lot of interesting choices here uh there are only about two or three per level at the higher end but at the low ones you have about four or five choices and mm -hmm. most of them fall into pretty predictable patterns they either give you abilities that reflect like that are essentially augmentations that you don't have to learn. Um, a good example of this is ocular advantage, which gives you either low light vision, dark vision, 60 feet, or the unflankable universal. I like control. that one. I like that. Unflankable yeah, that. that. So those other two options are great. But if I have dark vision, I don't need low light vision. A lot of species have low light vision. And I can buy dark vision, not only as an augmentation in my eyes, but as a magic item or an armor upgrade. So mm -hmm. I really can't get unflankable. Like there are a couple class features that do it. Like operatives can get it, but like this is level one un or level two unflankable. Like mm -hmm. it's, it's at the same time that the, that, uh, that I think, I think operatives and no, they, they get it at level seven from their class feature. So um, it's the one that makes you immune to basically like harrying fire and covering fire and all yeah. that too. Vanguards but, but like, get, get something as well, yeah. Yeah, they get. I think they get it at level eight because they have to pick it as a discipline. But like you get it at level two, that's really good. Like, that's really good. And then other ones you get are things like uh, options that let you spend MP. So like by default, there isn't a whole lot you spend on spend it, <clears throat> that you spend MP on in the base class, but. Um, you get options that let you pick more. No, oh. yeah. Uh, just looking through, uh, I love enhanced resistances. Just give yourself more resistances <laughs> to offset your terrible choice of being a mechanic who, uh, mm -hmm. a mechanic, uh, uh, niche who yeah. allowed fire damage to be your weak damage. <laughs> uh, if you're dumb like that, you can fix it. Uh, fearsome outburst also allows you to demoralize, uh, as a reaction. So even though you're a robot man who can't get morale bonuses, it doesn't matter. You make them scared and you're better than them. You are much better than them. Um, you get stuff like area strike, which basically turns your adaptive strike into a grenade. Like, mm -hmm. uh oh, <laughs> sound effects. Good stuff. Um, there, there's, there's a lot of them fall into these basic categories. Like uh, there's a six level enhanced mobility where you pick either a climb speed, a swim speed, a fly speed, 
and you gain it, it, it based on your land speed. And then, but it's okay. Whichever ones you don't pick, you could spend mutation points to gain during combat. It's like, oh, okay, that's that's really really good. Um, I also really like uh the augmented potential ability. It basically turns every augmentation you put into your body into a battery that you can draw on to gain mutation points faster. That's cool. Um, I don't know. Like, I think, I think a lot of these until we get to about 18th level, they're very, they, they, they feel safe and sensible. Like, Oh yeah, that's exactly what I expected. That's really yeah. cool. Uh, then you get to fission form at 18th yes. level. Yes. Why this uh, is not called mitosis kills me. Yeah. Vision <laughs> yes. form does exactly what James just implied with that science reference. And it splits you into two creatures. You control both of them and they both have access to a lot of, to your resources, but like damage to one hurts the overall you it's, it's wild. Like you can see why it takes up about a quarter of the page on mm -hmm. that page. Mm -hmm. It's on, but man, like, is it worth it? So I think that's, I, I honestly think that's probably one of the coolest ones in the whole set. Regenerative form at 18th level is also really cool, but that one is impressive. Yeah. yeah efficient form changes how you play the game. It mm -hmm. does. Mm -hmm. So if you go to the next page, there are, th there are four like sample builds. Like we typically get out of Starfinder. There's one for each of the niches. It's pretty cool. Um, art's awesome as always. So uh, let's talk a bit about the evolutionists and our thoughts on this class. Uh, who would like to start? Uh, John, like final I thoughts. I thought you were going to say something uh, around the level 18. Oh, yeah. One thing I was going to say is that, you know, pretty much you're only going to get one or two of those. So you're you're yeah. you're deciding that kind of the, the, your end game, how you want to play the game, uh, you know, for those. And I the fission form just seems to me like a no brainer, you know, that mm -hmm. you, you you suddenly double your party's combative ability, you know, so it's 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 really, really pretty cool. Um Final that one thoughts. is crazy with Pathmaster. <laughs> yes. Because <laughs> you could split everyone in your party. Yeah, you could double. You could, oh, I didn't even think about that. If you had an army, <laughs> you now have two armies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Make sure they all have ranged attacks, though, because I don't think they can get, uh, they can go too far away. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, overall, I'll go ahead and start. Overall with the evolutionists, I... You know, when I looked at this during the, the pre-test and uh, I actually had, uh, Ron and I kind of went through these here, I like how things have been fleshed out. And with these adaptations, as you mentioned, there's a couple that you kind of expect. Uh, most classes have some things that allow you to do these sorts of things. And then they have a couple that are just kind of really cool and, and specific. And I really like the, the, uh, the fact that Fission Form is a unique thing that no other class has something like this, you know? So the ability to, to pick a specific niche and build things out, I actually think is a lot more interesting and more useful than the Vanguard disciplines. You know, when I'm building a Vanguard, you get the primary and the secondary, you know, I don't, none of them really seem to matter too much to me. These ones very specifically, you get very nice different bonuses depending on the niche you play. And so it makes very distinct play styles, role play, everything. So I really like that aspect of the evolutionist. I think that the evolutionist is a fun, interesting class. I think that it doesn't have as much things that are unique that I would, as I would have liked. It has a lot of class features that are very like, okay, well, this is how your progression track works. And these are the things you get. But like, I've seen speed boosts in class before. I've seen mm -hmm. soldiers onslaught before. I've seen a lot of this stuff before. And like fission form and regenerative form are very cool, but they're also the 18th level abilities. Where's like, where's the low level stuff that lets me change my body around and do like wild and crazy things. I think that this class is very cool and very interesting, but I think if you're looking to play a mountain biking witch, this isn't a mountain bi mountain biking witch class. It it feels a little too much like like a rehash and like of like other classes things. And I and this is just mm. my opinion, but I think it relies a little bit too much on the augmentations to carry it in the unique uniqueness compartment. That being said. I like the flavor of this class. I think it's cool. When they announced evolutionist, I assumed we were going to get a shape-shifting class finally. James mm -hmm. will remember that I thought we were getting mm -hmm. one for Biohacker too. Uh, but that's not what this is. But what this is is still cool. 
Like, I like this class. I think that this class desperately needs a spread or two in like an upcoming book to be like, here's a whole bunch of things for the evolutionists that are unique and define this class's play style. Because I would argue that if you have to wait till 18th level to get an ability that is like the standout cool new class feature, you didn't make a class that has a strong identity of its own, despite having a very interesting resource uh, system. Hmm. I saved you for last, James, because you're very good at like uh, moderating my hot takes. <laughs> I, 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 I have two different mindsets of what the evolutionist is. The first one and the starking one is just a shifter that I would want to play. Um, <laughs> Touche. The, the, the second more realistic one is this would be like baby's first sold, soldier or blood rager, baby's first blood rager. You're basically a soldier, but with magical powers or they're not magic, but technological yeah. powers or whatever to augment them, to give you some sort of spice or edge. Um, I think there's top end potential for what a soldier would be good at, um, but it doesn't stray outside of that. Um, so you can do things like hit damage numbers, uh, hit physical challenges, um, but none of that um, flair that makes it different makes it necessarily good at things outside of that. Um, yeah. It's going to stay in a fight. It's going to be the last thing standing most likely in that fight. Um, and whether or not um, that matters it kind of depends on the group around it. Um, role play is what you make it. Um, I don't think there's anything that really keeps you from doing anything that you'd want uh, here. Um, but it seems like there's been a lot of moderation and thought into how you're using evolution points and how you might not want them. Because, um, I don't know, this this is purely speculation. But it seems like there was some a point during play testing where people were getting these points and then were getting harmed by them. So... Every yeah. so often, there's just sentences that are like, you could just, or you could just get rid of these. We don't care. You can take them or you can leave them. Yeah. And um, for a class that already has so much to keep track of, to throw all that on there, it, it feels like it kind of loses that focus as uh, the fighter or the soldier with a flare stand in. I think it's good. I think it's fun. Um, I would be somebody who would take all that damage and try to one around things because that's, that's my idea of fun. But um, I can see how it wouldn't be for everybody. But I do think it's a good class and once you get supplemental material which i'm sure is there uh yeah. you'll probably see it get built out a bit more because while things like niches um are limited to augment types it doesn't mean you can't have alternate augment types you know or mm. you can't have alternate themes based on the same augment type milo three in chat has a very interesting point do you remember that in the uh play test you had to spend evolution at points to have full bab on this class that's right yeah so he, according so i think milo b is right when he says in chat that like with like yeah. honestly the the resource system probably didn't get like the the large scale play testing it needed because the entire play test everybody was just auto spending them and not hoarding them to get the bonuses so like yeah. there probably wasn't a ton of play test on what it looks like when you keep them um, which which <laughs> is really funny to say because like so like nobody was really interfacing with these penalties um mm -hmm. i you know what like i i don't like having class features that go out of the way to hurt me like i'm okay with like if i'm a, a barbarian i'm taking a minus two will penalty like that's fine but like i've never been a really big fan of like the oracle curses either like my ability should make me better and a lot of these penalties are kind of rough. I feel like something that didn't scale and was just like, yeah, here's your penalty. Like, it seems like this class was really made with this, this high, I, this high concept of the more I transform, the more I lose my humanity. It feels like mm. Pathfinder 1E corruptions the class or even Starfinder corruptions the class. You remember when Peter got corrupted by shadow energy in our, our signal yeah. screens game? Yeah, mm -hmm. like that's what it feels like to me is what it wants to be. But like, I don't know. I think there's a difference between a corruption that I willingly took and like, I mean, yeah, I chose to be an evolutionist. But like once I made the decision on what class theme I wanted, I didn't really get a choice on what powers I got. And the, uh, there's really not a lot you can do with that penalty. I don't know. I I want to see where this class goes with some other abilities. I think I this is probably a like an intermediate class to me like i would recommend it to somebody who's been playing starfinder for a bit and wants to try something new yeah. it's definitely no nano site where like you, i i would not recommend that class to anybody who does not know the system well mm -hmm. but yeah, like, uh, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah well what could that be like i don't know but um <laughs> Yeah, I, I in general I like it. I definitely think that it's a class that's going to need some polish. Yeah, yeah, it should it should get that as more releases come. I Give mean, us full, more. When, when you're full bab, six hit points, six stamina, you're 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 always relevant in a fight. Yep. And thankfully, most of this game is fighting, so you'll be relevant <laughs> a lot. <laughs> um, but uh, that's going to wrap up our thoughts on the evolutionists for now. Uh, it's been about an hour, so this is usually when we like log off and like say goodbye and do the salute and whatnot. But uh, I we would be remiss not to mention that PaizoCon is starting in like two days. So uh, I'd like to take a minute or two. Uh, what are you all expecting to see for Starfinder out of this? Obviously, we know that uh, Starfinder Enhanced was announced as coming out, I think, in October or November of this October, year, right? Yeah. yeah. And we also know that there's a comic book coming called Drift Angels, yes. uh, Starfinder Drift Angels. But we don't really know much beyond that. It hasn't really been made all that public. Uh, I think the Scoured Stars book is this gen is a Gen Con release this year, right? Yeah, yeah, that's so. exciting. So, uh, yeah. what are you two excited for? What are you? What are not even excited for? What are you hoping we'll hear about coming to Starfinder at Pizocon? Um, That starship combat in the new edition is being broke off, broken off into a different game that I could ignore. <laughs> that's fair that's fair uh would you expect to see that in its own book or in starfinder enhanced oh uh hopefully its own book yeah uh, it, it would it would be kind of funny if like they enhanced starfinder by just saying you don't have to play starship combat <laughs> you can only you only have to do this if you want to yeah yeah that's certainly a thing uh what about you john well first of all i'll say no comment on what you just talked about okay. um <laughs> I am looking forward to see, well, first of all, I, I'm looking forward to the Starfinder comic a lot. It's coming out yeah. next month. And the I'm actually, so beautiful. Uh, next week, gorgeous. I'm going to interview uh, James Sutter uh, about it as well. So I'm, I'm really excited to, to see that. I, I cannot wait for Starfinder Enhance. I know of so many cool things that are coming, and uh, I look forward <laughs> to many of those, and I hope they... I hope they tease some of them, um, you know, even stuff I didn't work on. I know somebody worked on some really cool stuff, and I can't wait to see the specifics of it. Uh, I think everyone is going to be uh, excited about that. Cool. Ooh. I, I mean, so we don't know what type of adventure content they're doing after the Scoured Stars. So, like... Uh, that's probably this year's adventure path, right? The what we were getting, because it sounds like after Drift Hackers, they're moving towards big books. Yes. So I would yes. expect to hear what the next adventure path for Starfinder is after that. Um, I think I would also expect. You know what? It's just a hunch, and I don't have any evidence for it. It wouldn't surprise me. So, like, obviously, we know that the OGL stuff happened this year, right? And we know that Pathfinder 2nd Edition is getting remastered. Uh, we've also been told that they don't have any plans for Starfinder yet. Um, I think that one of two things with that can happen. Either we are going to get some sort of a timetable, uh, meaning that we're going to hear about Starfinder remastered at PaizoCon. Uh, if we do, I don't think it's going to happen for at least a year. And judging that they didn't make, a, make us wait a year to learn about Pathfinder Remastered, I don't think that they'll tell us about it until it's going to be like, you know, around that same timetable, about six months. So I'm not expecting to get that. But it is a possibility. It's a very low one. It would be cool if it would. I, I don't yeah. expect it either, though. I think yeah, I think I, Remastered is going to come with with a 2.0, and I, I think it's too soon. I, I, think Star, I, I think Starfinder is old enough that it would have to be a 2.0. I'm, but you know what? Honestly, we could do an entire episode talking about what we would want out of a Starfinder Second Edition. We should probably do that. That sounds like a good thing to talk about, and not something to do in like a three-minute segment at the end of an episode oh, yeah. because I think that requires like some actual like brain juice. Uh, but yeah. so I'm expecting to hear what the next Adventure Path volume is. I'm expecting to hear what the next hardcover after Enhanced would is probably around spring next year. Um, we haven't gotten a monster book in a while, and we don't really know what monster books for Starfinder are going to look like, because I think we were told Alien Archive 4 was going to be our last Alien Archive, right? Does that sound right? I don't remember. Because we got so. Drift Crisis instead of Alien Archive, a yeah. new Alien Archive. 
Um, so maybe a new setting event. I know Thirsty's been kind of coy about wanting to do something uh, on uh, on his Twitter account I've been following. So if you're listening to that, maybe go check out Thurston uh, Hillman's Twitter account uh, at OnCallGM and poke through the, the messages and see if you can find any uh, special hints and tricks or whatever. Um, but I think those are the two big things. And I'm expecting enhanced spoilers. I'm expecting yes. them to really show off enhanced. I think so, too. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but uh, I think those are also very safe predictions. If I'm going to make a crazy prediction, my crazy prediction, I think that my crazy prediction is going to be that we're due for a big class options book, something like Com. I don't think that mm. we've gotten, because like every, cla every class option book that we've gotten has been like a hybrid with some other content, like building the lore, building magic, what does tech look like? I think we're due for a book that's just like, here is an oodle of class stuff in Joy. Uh, and honestly, that's arguably enhanced, maybe. We know narrative Starship combat isn't enhanced, so I don't know. But if I had to take a guess, I'd say a big player option book would make a lot of sense. Mm, wild prediction. Uh, the next AP is going to be a Jade Regent style uh, adventure path, but you have to take Strawberry Machine Cake to play at an ultimate show. Oh my God, that'd be really good. <laughs> Yeah, you hit small gigs and then eventually hit the gig to end all gigs and somehow save the galaxy. So would you be playing Starberry Machine Cakes groupies? Like, because you couldn't play the band. You'd be groupies. You'd be roadies. Thank you very much. Roadies get stuff done. That's true. That'd be, <laughs> that'd be really cool. You know what? Yeah. Like, as someone who's done, like, the first two books of Fly Free, where it's that's the space trucker adventure, like, mm -hmm. that setup is really good. Like, it's fun. Uh, I, I honestly, we haven't done it for a while. Um, Leo is, is busy, but like, I loved that game and miss it dearly. I think the setup was incredible. So I hope that we get it. And if we don't, someone better message James and be like, yo, James, you want to write your first adventure path volume? And James will be like, no, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I have a toddler. <laughs> yeah. You'll be like, can I have a year to write it? Cause there's a screaming baby at my hip. <laughs> no okay she won a trumpet at the carnival today it was a mistake <laughs> stakes were made what about, what about you john bold predictions bold yeah, predictions a bold prediction that's that we're looking at i i think the, i think a bold prediction would be um starfinder remastered i i don't think that there's any way that they had the time to do that but i think and that's one I would I, I think that would be cool to see that they would stepped up the timeline because I don't think uh, I don't think 2.0 is going to come out for playtesting for two years at least in full full version in three years just timing wise. Mm. But I'm, if they if they step it up and say, you know what, in 2024 you're going to get the new thing, that would be exciting. I think the thing that could make that so like here's here's my prediction on that. Ready. Okay. Okay, so Pathfinder obviously needed to have a remaster done for like the orc stuff. That's their flagship yeah. product. That product getting harmed in any way hurts Paizo more than Starfinder getting yeah. harmed because Starfinder is smaller comparably. Not saying it's insignificant, but it's definitely smaller. And on top of that, Pathfinder has had more OGL material in it than Starfinder does. If you think about Starfinder, yeah. the majority of content in Starfinder is not like OGL stuff. Like most of the alien archives don't update old things. Most yeah. of them just add lots of new aliens. Mm -hmm. I think that, uh, and a lot of the things that are the same are like game mechanics names, like a, a armor class and whatever. I think it's harder. I think Wizards knows it's more of a risk to sue them over something like Starfinder that is clearly very different from D&D &D than Pathfinder, which is very clearly similar. Yeah. Obviously, a company like Wizards of the Coast taking Paizo to court, uh, the goal is not necessarily to be right, but to drain their opponent's money re and financial resources. But mm -hmm. like, I think that that's more of a risk. Like if, if it was, if, if Paizo could get to the point where a judge had to make a ruling, they could lose more going after Starfinder than Pathfinder. That's my, my, my gut opinion based on being in the industry and what like I'm thinking, but I might not be right. Uh, I am not a lawyer. So yeah. don't take my advice as legal advice. Yeah. In, in terms of intellectual property, Wizards has to go after companies in order to protect whatever they claim is their IP. Um, and so regardless of how different it is, eventually, if, if they're saying there's IP of theirs in there, they're going to have to make, they're going to have to go after it. Uh, it's just like you're saying, the likelihood yeah. of winning, 
it doesn't matter if if you don't as a company if you don't try to protect your ip then then the courts won't find in favor of you down the road to say well you didn't yeah. try the last three times why do you care now so this is why yeah. people get all these random cease and desist letters even though they have nothing to do with that particular yeah. brand they just happen to have the same name it's because legally to uh, not set a precedence of, of ignoring it co companies have to do it so they will it's, eventually God, I, I this is another topic i could do an entire show talking about even though it's not really like a beyond or starfinder yeah. topic it is tabletop adjacent because man i have so many thoughts on it and a lot of it isn't really informed it's just like well it's almost like like thinking like the ramifications of what an actual lawsuit could be like does does blizzard does or i'm sorry does uh does wizards of the coast actually have a claim on saying that Knowles expressed as hyena humanoids is D, D copyright when they've allowed world of warcraft to use that same expression for the last 20 years like yeah. is that something they can actually do like it's and it's such a and like if they go after paizo but they chose to ignore blizzard because if they sue blizzard blizzard could actually hold them out and tank them because they're actually competition like what 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 is that like it's so it's such a yeah it's such a thing like i don't I mean, even know what you, you, you'd, you'd probably end up in some type of summary judgment where it's like this claim is upheld and this one isn't yeah essentially yeah um but uh that's all we have for the evolutionist and uh, our brief paizocon predictions thank you so much for joining us on no direction beyond uh as always if you like our content please join our discord server you can go to our website at no direction podcast.com and there's a big button that you can click to go there we have lots of great blog content most of it is for either general gm advice or focused on pathfinder but it's still a really good read and we definitely appreciate all of your help and support uh, we have a link to a Patreon there too, if you want to help continue funding this, so that we can, uh, you know, have uh, different types of recording equipment for our cast members who need recording equipment, and we can continue to like get art for things that we do and whatnot. Um, we again, we appreciate all of our your support, and this type of content really couldn't happen without you. We do this for you because uh, it's fun, and y'all seem yeah. to enjoy it. Um, yeah. yeah, but uh, until next time, uh, we invite you to go beyond uh, with no direction well i don't know what i was doing there for a second <laughs> okay <laughs> <laughs>